Rabbi, the tree that you curse has withered. And Jesus does the classic Jesus move, right? In verse 22, he answered him, right? Have faith in God. <laughs> like, what? Hi and welcome to our Bible study today as we go through the teachings of Jesus uh, in the Gospel of Mark and Luke. And in today's passage, there's a ton to unpack, there's a lot to say, not in terms of the amount of teaching or content, but in how to connect and reflect on what Jesus says and what he did, right? Connecting his words to his actions, uh, which in this case, we often just brush it over, we don't pay attention to it. Uh, not knowing how it actually relates to one another. And it's actually one of the most familiar stories uh, that we know of Jesus, a record of what he did in a temple. But it's in what he did before and after that, which is baffling to many. So today we'll try to unravel that a little bit. But more importantly, we want to see uh, why Jesus said what he said and why he taught what he taught and how it affects us today. Right, so let's read from the passage. It's actually from Mark chapter 11, verses 12 to 26. But I will also read from Matthew chapter 21, verses 12 to 22. Just to contrast them for you, those are the same uh, pericope, we call it, or the same event. Right, I'll highlight some of the similarities and differences. So this is Mark chapter 11, uh, 12 to 26. On the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard this. And they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the, the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons, and he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him. But they feared him, because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city. Verse 20, As they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its root. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you curse has withered. And Jesus answered them, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that he, what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore I say, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive, if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive your trespasses. Now let me read to you uh, from Matthew 21, verses 12 to 22. It says, And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer. But you made it a den of robbers. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they say to him, Do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes. Have you never read? Out of mouth of infants and nursing babies, uh, you have prepared praise. And leaving them, he went out of the city to Bethany and lodged there. In the morning, he, as he was returning to the city, he became hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the wayside, he went to it and found nothing on it but only leaves. And he said to it, May no fruit ever come from you again. And the fig tree withered at once. When the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How did the fig tree wither at once? And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, Be taken up 
and thrown into the sea. It will happen. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. Right, so we are covering the account of the cleansing of the temple and also the cursing of the fig tree. Uh, let me just say this uh, right off the way. I don't like either way of those uh, of the two terms to describe what happened. Okay, I don't like to say uh, cleansing of the temple or cursing of the fig tree. Uh, I'll point out why, but that's what we are talking about here. And this is one of the passages where uh, there are seemingly odd sayings and actions by Jesus, right? That just makes us scratch our head, uh, particularly the fig tree incident. And the conclusion of the whole episode that just seems to come out of nowhere, you know, where Jesus taught some really significant things, significant things to the disciples about faith and prayer and forgiveness. Then in the middle, uh, in, at least in Mark's account, we have the temple cleansing episode. And the question is, do all this relate to one another? To which I will obviously say today, yes, they are related. Which leads us to the next question of how, how they are related. Now, the reason I read both Mark and Matthew's version is to highlight the difference for us. Okay? You notice that Mark's account has the fig tree episode split into two, okay? before and after the temple incident. Sort of like a sandwich. Right, sort of like a sandwich, while Matthew's version has it happening right after the temple cleansing. Now, we can argue which one is more accurate, which one is more historical, which one is the version that actually happened, but I don't think that's the main point, right? But if you ask me, I think it is Mark's version that's closer uh, to the historical event, but exactness in report in terms of chronology, right, is... It's rarely the main purpose of the writers, especially the writers of the, uh, the Gospels. But the theological messaging is more important. Okay? How do the writers interpret what uh, happened, what occurred, and the significance it has for the disciples of Christ now? And this is often reflected in the way that they arrange things, right? And the way that they omit or include certain information. And the difference in detail or account is not detriment to its historicity, but actually to me it's a strength to demonstrate that it is actually true because it shows that something actually happened and the writers were uh, analyzing and thinking how does this uh, event apply to themselves and their readers and they feel, felt that uh, while reflecting it, arranging it certain ways helped to uh, bring forth a theological message clearer. Right? Another difference in Matthew's account is that we see there an episode of healing uh, and children crying out Hosanna, uh, which is not present in Mark, Mark's account. But since we are focusing on Mark's account, I won't be covering this one, okay? But the final difference that I do think is important is while Mark splits the fig tree account into two, Matthew has another line of teaching after the whole episode where he says, Truly I say to you, if you have faith and don't doubt, so far this is saying, the difference is here, you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree. So this line in the, the teaching at the end is not found in Mark. And this actually serves uh, to point and to focus certain things about the fig tree incident, right? Which Mark does this by splitting the incident, okay? And it actually brings us back uh, brings back the attention to the cursing of the fig, fig tree in the first place, right? Telling us to link actually the fig tree to the cleansing of the temple together, to bring these two events together, okay? So, let's start looking a bit closer at the passage. And the first thing I want to uh, cover is the meat or the middle of the sandwich, right? The, 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 the cleansing of the temple and how this is significant, right? The significance of the temple action, I will call this, right? Again, I don't like the term, about the cleansing, but I'll use it because it is familiar to all of us. And the reason I don't like that term is because I don't think it is a cleansing at all. Okay? Cleansing has the idea that after the action, after the cleansing, what is left would be clean, uh, back to uh, a shape where it is for use, it is ready to be used. Some have suggested that this is what Jesus wanted. You know, as a sort of reform of the temple, restoring to uh, what God 
originally had in mind or to get rid of the things that profane the temple or some impure activities of the temple which was the temple which was meant for holy acts of worship of prayer of sacrifice now i think this is not the case i don't think this is what jesus wanted to do because we see uh, that he he drove out both the 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 ones who sold and bought in the temple overturning the tables of the money changers and actually barred people from bringing anything into the temple and if this is the cleansing of the temple right this is meant to reform the temple well it would only last until he goes out of the temple <laughs> then the buyers and the sellers will simply reset set up again and they just resume business okay? and mind you there are a lot of people there at that time because it was actually near passover this is right after the triumphal entry, after which one week later, uh, Jesus is going to be crucified and we know that it's during the Passover. And so there will be plenty of pilgrims trying to secure their sacrificial lamb, you know, the lamb that was certified uh, by the temple, uh, using, had to buy using temple money, certified as a blameless lamb to be sacrificed during uh, the Passover. Okay? So, if Jesus meant for this, uh, to be a cleanse or reform the temple, right? There's another problem with this. Why bother to do this if later he's going to predict that the temple is going to be destroyed right? through foreknowledge, right? It's going to be destroyed. It's mentioned in Mark 13, verse 2. This is the Oliver Discourse in Mark. So it seems to me and for many others as well that the purpose is not uh, to cleanse but to actually deliver a message, a prophetic message that he acted out he acted it out, a sign act, like what Ezekiel used to do when he prophesied uh, over Israelite, over the Israelites who are in exile in Babylon. And his is a demonstration, okay? It's a demonstration of prophetic protest that symbolically actually stops all the activities that contribute to the temple's uh, normal functioning, right? If you think about it, he stopped the money changer. Okay, if, he, if money cannot be exchanged into temple money, then uh, monetary support for the, the temple sacrifices and priesthood will end. And if the animals cannot be sacrificed, cannot be purchased, then sacrifice must end. And if no vessels or nothing can be brought into the temple, then all worship activities would end because they use those vessels for uh, 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 ritual cleansing. Right. So for me, Jesus does not seek to purify or cleanse the current temple worship but he symbolically attacks the very function of the temple and it is to announce its destruction its end the temple's glory days are coming to an end and in private as i mentioned jesus will predict to the disciples that the temple was going to be destroyed in chapter 13 and the reason that jesus prophetically proclaimed all of this through the sign act is because of two things and both of them are a quotation from the old testament the first one is from isaiah 56 uh, verse 7 that says his house will be called a house of prayer for all nations but we actually need to read isaiah 56 in its context so we'll see that in verse 1 to 8 if you read isaiah 56 it's actually talking about people who may think that they are excluded from god's salvation Right? They think they are excluded from God's salvation, but they are actually welcomed by God. Right? Uh, in chapter 56, verse 3, it mentions the foreigners or non-Israelites or Gentiles uh, being called by God. In verse 4, it mentions the eunuchs who are not actually allowed to enter into the temple according to uh, Deuteronomic law, Deuteronomy 23, verse 1, but now are called into God's temple. And then verse 8, which mentions the outcasts of Israel. Those who thought that they were kicked out, uh, some of them maybe you can think about the lepers, I think, uh, people who are uh, deemed unclean or un impure so that they cannot get in. And these people, God calls them in. And God meant for all these people to worship and pray in His temple. And Jesus expects that uh, to be apparent and in practice during His time. But what He sees is something different. He wanted to see uh, an embodiment of inclusive love people to be able to pray and worship god with no barriers but what the temple during that time of jesus had become was a kind of nationalistic symbol right where there were so many barriers barring people out 
from being able to enter to worship God or to pray. Okay? They cannot join in with the Jews. The Gentiles cannot join in with the Jews. They can't enter the temple to worship anymore. And there's a segregation that served to divide Israel from the nations. And it is this nationalistic symbol of the temple that needed to be broken down, that needed to be destroyed. And he acted this out in a prophetic cleansing. Okay? When he, and, and even when he died on the cross, right, the temple veil was split from top to bottom. And in Mark's gospel especially, you see that it was a Gentile that confessed Jesus was the Son of God. This is in Mark 15, uh, 38 to 39. So, and it is this nationalistic symbol that needs to be broken down. And speaking of this, this is what the second quotation of the Old Testament is all about from Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 11. Again, you must read uh, Jeremiah 7 more than just verse 11 to know what it is talking about. And there, it is about judgment that is proclaimed on Israel, asking them to repent. Right? Verse 3, Amend your ways, amend your deeds, and I will let you dwell in this place. Right? Verse 4 says this, this is important, do not trust in these deceptive words. What words? This is the temple of the Lord. This is the temple of the Lord. This is the temple of the Lord. Three times it is mentioned. So for them, God says, this is wrong. Okay? You say this is the temple of the Lord. Don't trust in these deceptive, deceptive words. And what is the problem? Why would God warn them this? Well, verse 6 shows the problem. If you do not oppress the sojourners, so God gives them a solution. If you don't oppress the sojourners or the foreigners, the fatherless or the widows, right? These are the, the outcasts of Israel. Or shed innocent blood in this place. And if you do not go after other gods to your own harm. So this is talking about idolatry, right? Verse 9 also, they steal, they murder, they commit adultery, steal and murder. Sounds like robbers. Right? And what does the Pharisees or the scribes during that time do? They rob people. Right? And do, for the sacrificial system, it only benefits themselves. And to this, God declared in verse 11, Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? That was the issue. They were not faithful to God. They thought by saying, This is the temple of the Lord, they thought they were safe. Just by saying that, right? They thought they were safe just by having the temple with them. They thought that God's presence was constant, was assurance because the temple was with them. But God said in verse 14 and 15 in Jeremiah 7 that he will cast them out of his sight. And that is the judgment. And if we think about it, right? If we think about the word then, right? It's not where uh, the bad or evil acts are done. <laughs> A den is where either the lions feel safe or the robbers in this case feel safe. A den is where they feel at home, right? where they can enjoy their loot after their evil act. And that is the problem with the temple during Jeremiah's time and now also during Jesus' time, where people feel comfortable, people feel safe in the temple and became a refuge for them when they do bad things and evil acts, a den of robbers and thieves. They find fake comfort while oppressing those who truly need God, those who are seeking God, the eunuchs, uh, those who are outcasts of the Israelites, uh, the Gentiles, the foreigners, the fatherless, the widows. And these are people they have uh, discriminated. So the den of robbers actually doesn't refer to the act of trade in the temple, right? It's about the false security that they find themselves in the temple. They don't do their robbing in the den. So God, Jesus is not condemning or, or not. The, Jesus' problem is not with them, uh, uh, in a sense, uh, doing what they do, but finding false security uh, in the temple. Right? The sanctuary of God has now become a sanctuary of bandits and robbers who think that they are protected from, from God's judgment. But when Jesus overturned the tables, right, uh, halted all the trade, it's not to cleanse the temple, but it's to proclaim judgment, right, prophetically through the act that the temple and its false security is done for, is coming to an end, is over, right? And it's against this backdrop that will enlighten us 
on the incident with the fig tree. So now we come to the significance of the fig tree action, right? And actually for the readers at that time, right, it's the other way around. Okay? It's likely that the cursing of the fig tree, while it sandwiches the uh, temple event, that will inform them of what it meant uh, for Jesus to cleanse the temple. But for us, uh, I chose to do it the other way around because I think the cursing of the fig tree is the confusing part for us. Because there are a few things here that are very odd. First, Jesus was hungry. Okay? He, uh, and he saw the fig tree had leaves. He went and see, found nothing but, but uh, leaves, found nothing to eat. And there's one, that one line in verse 13 that says, For it was not the season for figs. And then he went on to curse the tree. <laughs> right and say may no one uh, ever eat fruit from you again and to us that's really odd <laughs> if it was meant as jesus's reaction okay they were like why curse the fig tree when it is not the season for figs why do you expect to find fruits there but i'm going to argue that it is not a reaction but it is a deliberate action by jesus and i think there's a hint in the final line in verse 14, this was his main purpose, which says, and his disciples heard it. I think he did it so that the disciples can uh, hear it and there's going to be a lesson there. Okay? And if you know Jesus, right, you know that all that he did was no accident. Okay? Don't you think that he knows the tree had no fruit? Don't you think that he knew it was not the season for figs? Right? So, if we can agree that he knew all these things, then his action is deliberate. Then what he says was actually not a curse, a reaction at that time, but uh, it, was, uh, it was actually a, a prophetic act and a foretelling that will relate to what happened in the temple later on. Now, just for your information, I will mention this, alright? There are certain explanations of how, even though it is not the season for figs, there could already be small uh, little buds of figs or figlets that could be eaten, even though it might be sour or bitter, right? I don't think that's relevant for the explanation, but it is there uh, if you desire to know more. But I will just move on from that. Uh, do go find out more information on that, uh, though I don't think it is that relevant for us, right? Now, I believe the unfruitful fig tree is really pointing us towards the unfruitful temple. Okay? I repeat that. The unfruitful fig tree is pointing us towards the unfruitful temple. And it points us to what Jesus will do in the temple. Judgment, proclaiming his end, as I've mentioned just now, right? And what Jesus did in the temple was demonstrated the next day. The disciples witnessing the fig tree withering away and it withered to its root. So in case the disciples were not certain of what happened in the temple was a judgment, right? The fig tree ought to show it. The, uh, the fig tree demonstrates what Jesus had done in the temple. Right? It's a miracle that serves as a prophetic sign act, right? It was saying, you know what I did to the temple yesterday? It will be just like this fig tree. The temple system, they are false security, they are safe place, the den for robbers, it's all going to be withered away down to its roots. The tree, the fig tree had leaves giving the impression that there may be something to eat, but it was fruitless. So was the temple, giving the impression that there was acts of worship to God, right? There was acts of worship or prayer, but it was actually fruitless as well. And when the disciples noted that the fig tree withered away, Peter remembered, right? Recall verse 14. Huh? Verse 14 says, the disciple had heard it. It is purposely mentioned, right? And this is the lesson that we can learn from the fig tree and the temple together. When Peter remembered it, he said, Rabbi, the tree that you curse has withered. And Jesus does the classic Jesus move, right? In verse 22, he answered him, right? Have faith in God. <laughs> like, what? Verse 23, Whoever says to this mountain, Be taken up and thrown to the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Verse 24, Whatever you ask in prayer, believe. And verse 25, when you, Whenever you stand praying, forgive. Now, it seems really odd. Why would the withering of the fig tree has lessons on faith, prayer, and forgiveness? But if we really understood 
what Jesus was really doing in the temple, and if we understood what the fig tree action was meant to signify, then we will know why faith, prayer, and forgiveness is important. And let me show you how they are related. Okay, let me show you how. We often generalize verse 23. Okay, verse 23 which says, uh, whoever says to this mountain be taken up that, okay? We often generalize that as faith to move mountains, correct? But look at what it says, okay? And I've checked in the Greek to make sure it is right, okay? It is not talking about faith to move any mountain. Look at it closely. But it's actually faith to move this mountain. This mountain, tuta in Greek, right? It specified this. And where they were at, was the Temple Mount or Mount Zion. And Jesus is talking about faith to move this mountain where the temple was situated, be taken up and thrown into the sea. With faith, this mountain, which all uh, the religious symbols, the sacrificial system, the temple, the religion, will be taken up and thrown into the sea. Sounds very much like judgment. Right? Sounds very much like all these things will come to an end. But the mention of faith, prayer and forgiveness here is also important. If the temple and the sacrificial system will be taken away and the national symbol of the temple will be overturned, what is the true way to God then? Right? That will be on the question, uh, on, on the minds of the disciples. If all these symbols are taken away, then what is the true way to God? Well, the true way is believing faith. It is prayer where we seek God, where we speak to God, where we have a relationship with God and forgiveness, the message of the cross and what Jesus taught in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us as we forgive others, doing this in love. And these are what God really wants, right? And it is a sacrifice. It is Jesus' sacrifice that will be uh, sufficient for all of us. And this is open to all to Gentiles, to the foreigners, to the widows, to the fatherless. God's house will be a house of prayer for all nations. And God's house, the temple, is not meant for a refuge or safe place for people doing the opposite of what God wants. It is not a den for robbers, but it is to draw the nations, draw people to himself. All right? So, I've mentioned a lot. What would be the lesson for us today? What's the lesson for us now? You know, if you don't read the passage in context and don't relate the fig tree incident with the temple event, then we're going to feel like, you know, just reading verse 22 to 25 is sufficient, right? There we learn that, oh, we have faith to move mountains. We need to have faith to move mountains. We need to have faith in prayer and we need to forgive when we pray. Simple, right? But if we do that, we will miss the whole lesson. We must take into consideration the context that, that this is in and how the fig tree and the temple episode actually fit together. And this sets up Jesus' teaching about faith, prayer and forgiveness. And we have to ask ourselves, are we like the fig tree? Are we like the temple? Are we being fruitful? Or are we merely finding safety in God's house, hiding from something? You know, uh, are we finding safety just in the church, just in his kingdom, wanting protection from the king, but secretly we are robbing people outside? Uh, are we taking advantage of people? Or maybe we do not consider other people worth our time to share the gospel with? Or our actions may be pushing people away. We might make people think twice about coming to church, about knowing this God. And this would be our equivalent of this time of being called a den of robbers, right? And one way to make sure that we do not fall into this trap is to make sure that what we do in church is not inwards looking, right? Programs after programs or events after events that just entertain ourselves. And the Word of God is not meant to, kept, to be kept in the church but meant to be preached and shared so that others may be convicted of it as well, right? And we can check where we are spending uh, where we are spending more is it more outwards or more inwards this is both in the church level as well as the personal level right so the church is not a safe place or hiding place but the church is a place where we send people out becoming fishers of men and draws people in draws people 
to Christ. But most importantly, we must know what the kingdom of God looks like now. The three things, faith, prayer, and forgiveness. Faith, prayer, and forgiveness. And this is the hallmark of the believing community right? of Jesus, the disciples of Jesus. And we need to cultivate all three of this in our lives. And we need to ask ourselves, which of these three are we struggling in? Okay? And we know which areas we are struggling in. We need to seek God and ask Him to help us to increase them in our lives. And I would say, seek first to increase our faith so that we may pray unceasingly. That's a result of having faith. So that we can forgive others in love. That's a result of having faith in God. Just as God has loved us and forgiven us. Right? I, I hope this has been helpful to you to see how we can link the fig tree incident and the, the, the temple cleansing incident together and how it truly affects us right now. Let me pray for all of us before we bring our time to an end. Father, we look to you and Jesus, your actions may seem odd and weird if you take it out of context when you curse the fig tree, but we know you know what you are doing. And it's not that you are reacting towards it, but it was deliberate so that the disciples can hear. God, help us to not be like the fruitless fig tree or the fruitless temple. Help us not to be a temple where we rob people or we push people away or, or we set so many barriers that people cannot enter. But help us to be people where we forgive others, where we are praying unceasing for ourselves, for others, and we have faith in you. And this faith to move this mountain that signified the end of this system that bars people out, but you desire to draw all men to yourself. Help us, God, to have this faith. Help us, God, Lord, to pray unceasingly. Help us to forgive others as you have forgiven us. And Lord, help us not to take advantage of you and your kingdom, not to treat you like an insurance agent to protect ourselves from judgment. But Lord, help us to take seriously what you have commanded us to do, both the Great Commission and the Great Commandment, to love you, love others, to go and make disciples. We thank you, God. We surrender ourselves to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for listening.